Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Wherever you are in the world, we're happy to have you with us for this AgriLinks webinar. On behalf of AgriLinks, Feed the Future, and the Bureau for Food, for Food Security and Resilience, I'm Adam Ahmed. Welcome to this webinar on current and emerging threats to crops, building the knowledge base. So in the room, you see the chat pod. You can communicate with us and with one another by using that chat pod. There are a couple pods below the main presentation deck, one with links to both the AgriLinks event page and a video that one of our presenters wanted to share with you today, as well as a pod with the webinar slide deck, which you can download to have your own copy of the slide deck today. Right now, I'll be handing it over to Tor Edwards from the USAID Uganda Mission, who will give a high-level overview of the webinar. Thank you for being with us. We're glad to have you. All right. Thank you, Adam. Um, good day to all of you. I'm thrilled to be joining you for this today. Um, we are going to be talking about the current and emerging threats to crops and about specifically what research can do um, in the face of this. Uh, let me give you just kind of an overview of, of how the webinar is going to work. Uh, we are going to have four presentations, um, and then immediately after each presentation, we'll have a very brief time for any clarification questions, um, and then we'll go to the next one, and then once all of the presenters have, uh, have completed their presentation, then we'll have a longer question and answer uh, session for us to, to go over. I do encourage all of you to, as questions are occurring to you, go ahead and put them in the chat box, and we will try to make sure that w that we are able to glean them um, for the, the various questions and answer sessions. Um, so the first thing that I want to say is that uh, USAID has, has chosen to focus on agriculture in order to fuel economic growth and to promote food security. Um, we started with the Feed the Future initiative, and then when the global food security strategy was, was enacted, um, agriculture-led growth was one of the key pillars uh, that, that that engaged. The programming traditionally has focused on agricultural productivity, um, specifically increasing production and securing the safety throughout the value chains, um, and our researchers have been working closely alongside uh, the development efforts in order to make sure that we were able to do that. Um, they have also a lot been working alongside them to address the ongoing challenges that threaten agricultural growth. In addition to taking a look at productivity and to the, the kind of the known and ongoing threats, uh, we are repeatedly seeing emergent threats uh, come forward. In 2014, for instance, um, I was working in the Bureau for Food Security when our East Africa regional mission had flagged a novel disease of maize that was threatening the development gains that USAID had achieved in both economic growth, livelihoods, and food security due to the loss of the maize crop, um, and that was maize lethal necrosis disease. Our team ended up having to pull together researchers from across East Africa, um, along with uh, U.S. pathology and virology experts. We worked together with the private sector seed companies, with government regulators, and with the USAID missions in order to develop a rapid response to MLND. That was one disease. And so um, we, as you are all aware, we are constantly seeing new emergent threats through various invasive pathways. We have new diseases, we have new pathogen races, novel insect biotypes, as well as other types of pests. Um, all of these are then accelerated through international trade, through human mobility, um, and of course through climate change. Today we want to consider our efforts to combat these threats and how we're going to be able to deploy the necessary scientific tools to develop not just research-generated and, and evidence-based solutions, but also solutions that are going to be scalable. Um, to that end, um, I'd like to go ahead and start. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to our first presenter, um, Dr. Mooney. 
So Dr. Mooney is joining us. He's an entomologist. He has specialized in biological control and IPM in the tropics for over 35 years. He primarily works on biological control of invasive weeds. He also specializes in insect pests of tropical fruit and vegetable crops. He is the current program director for the Integrated Pest Management Innovation Lab. Um, and as such, he's been working with USAID and partner uh, institutions throughout the United States and developing countries uh, in Asia, Africa, Eastern Europe, and the Caribbean and Latin America. Um, in addition to his duties uh, at Virginia Tech, he is currently serving as the chairman of the Global Working Group on Homo... Dr. Mooney, you're going to have to correct me on this one, sorry. <laughs> Chromoliana for the International Organization for Biological Control. Um, as a major leader in his field, Dr. Mooney has published over 200 research and extension articles. This is the papaya mealybug and the invasive weed parthenium. Papaya mealybug and parthenium are native to Mexico. Parthenium in 1950s and papaya mealybug in 1990s started to invade their neighboring countries as well as the distant continents. In the process of invasion, only these organisms got transferred to the invaded countries, not their natural enemies. So they became invasive alien species in the introduced countries. Invasive alien species are known to cause millions of dollars in damage all over the world. In U.S. alone, invasive species cost about $120 billion in damage and also in the management costs. Invasive species, since they, they invade the countries without their natural enemies, they become very easy targets, are very amenable for biological, classical biological control. Classical biological control is introducing natural enemies from the pest native range into the invaded area so that they will be able to suppress the invaded pests. This technology has been widely used in all over the world and some of the examples I have started, but there are several of them. Papaya mealybug control, parthenium control in Australia, cassava mealybug control in Africa and Southeast Asia, mango mealybug control in Africa are some of the examples. Papaya mealybug scientific name is Paracacus marginatus. Even though it is called as Papaya mealybug, it has several hosts. It has over 60 different species as host plants. When it got introduced to, to Florida, USAID uh, scientists, US, sorry, USDA scientists and they have found three parasites. I will come to that a little later. And currently the papaya mealybug is in, has invaded uh, several countries in Africa and Asia, and Asia. So when this mealybug got introduced to Florida, USDA ARS scientists went to Mexico and found three effective parasites parasitizing this mealybug. They shipped these parasites to the Beneficial Insects Laboratory in Delaware and where they were screened for hyperparasites and also host species detested. Then they were all shipped to a laboratory in Puerto Rico and in that laboratory they were mass multiplied and supplied to the countries wherein mealy, papaya mealybug became invasive and a problem. This papaya mealybug showed up in Guam, one of the Western Pacific Islands, where I was working in 2002. When it became a problem over there, I contacted USDA APHIS scientist, Dr. Dale Myrick, and he was kind enough to send me these three parasites, and we released these parasites in June 2002 in Guam. Within four months, these parasites controlled this mealybug. In 2006, I moved to IPM Innovation Lab in Virginia Tech, and in 2008, I was traveling to Indonesia and India for, for the IPM Innovation Lab activities. At that time, I found this mealybug occurring in Bogar, Indonesia, and Coimbatore, India. 
When I found this mealybug in Coimbatore, India, I went to Delhi and informed the Indian Agricultural Research Institute administration that this mealybug is a new introduction to India and they should take up biological control activities to suppress this pest. And they worked and around and tried to get the parasites from Puerto Rico and it took about two hours. By that time, this mealybug moved from Coimbatore to all over southern India. And in August 2010, the parasites were introduced to India from Puerto Rico and they were imported to Bangalore. From there it was tested and cleared, trained for hyperparasites and others, and then they were field released. By February 2011, this parasite, this parasite controlled the mealybug. And by 2011, there was a big celebration in India for achieving the control of papaya mealybug. Dr. George Norton of Economics Department at Virginia Tech did an impact assessment study for the introduction of these parasites for controlling papaya mealybug in India. He came up with a figure of 500 million to 1.34 billion in benefits to India. Papaya mealybug also moved to Western Africa. It invaded Ghana in 2009 and then in around 2011. And both FAO and IATA took up biological control activities and suppressed this pest in West Africa within a few months. Coming to Parthenium, Parthenium histophorus is the scientific name. It is originated in Mexico. Its common name in Ethiopia is Paramasisa, meaning sign your land away. That is how serious this weed is in the introduced areas or countries. It is a very quick growing plant. It completes its life cycle within six to eight weeks and it produces lots of seeds, you know, about 25,000 seeds per plant, and it is highly allelopathic. Its center of origin, I mentioned Mexico, that is the primary center, but it also has a secondary center in South America, but the population of the Parthenium that migrated from Mexico to the other parts of the world started only from Mexico, not from South America. Currently, Parthenium it has invaded 48 countries in the world, in Africa, Asia, and Australia. This slide is, shows the climax model of Parthenium in Africa. The, all the shaded, red shaded area are suitable for Parthenium invasion. Currently, Parthenium occurs in the western part of South, 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 South Africa, Southern Africa, and also in the eastern uh, African countries. Currently, IPM Innovation Lab is working in Eastern Africa to suppress this weed so that this weed, the chance of this weed moving into Central and West of Western Africa will be less. Even if it gets more spread into Western, Central and Western Africa, we will be in a position with the technologies to suppress this weed by developing them in the Eastern African region. Platinum weed is the Parthenium weed can infest both cultivated areas, pasture lands, wastelands, homesteads, roadsides, railway tracks, and everywhere. So in the developing countries, mostly they use human labor and also mechanical means of controlling this pest because the herbicide is very expensive and also they have to come up with repeated ones but human labor is cheap, so they adopt this technology. By doing this, they get dermatitis. Parthenium is very is toxic, and also it is allergic. The pollens are allergic to human beings, and they cause rhinitis and asthma in humans. Australia has done a great job in controlling this pest using natural enemies. It started biological control of Parthenium in 1970. Since then, it has introduced 11 natural enemies from Central and South America. These natural enemies attack flowers, seeds, leaves, stems, and roots of the Parthenium. In 19, around 1970, Parthenium was controlled as a serious weed in 
or an oxious weed in Australia. Now it is considered just a weed, not an oxious one. IPM Innovation Lab involved in biological control of parkinium in Ethiopia in 2005. It established quarantine facility for species testing in Ethiopia. It sent scientists from Ethiopia to South Africa to get trained in biological control of weeds. And also it has uh, tested the natural enemies and got permission from the government of Ethiopia and USAID for field releases. Biological control of parkinium, the major activity is taking place in Australia and the second is in South Africa and third is in Ethiopia. Ethiopia, most of the activity is supported by the IPM Innovation Lab supported by USAID. So far two natural enemies have been established in Ethiopia. The first one is Jagogramma bicolorata. It is a seed feeding beetle. Here the beetle as well as its grubs feed on the leaves and defoliate them. The second one was a stem boring weevil. This one is cerocyphenis. It lays eggs on the flowers and the grubs bore into the stem and reach the, reach the roots. And in that process, this weevil will kill the plant. Zygogramma beetle was introduced in, in wet area at Valanchetti in July 2016. You can see parkinium is growing along this roadside. And by September 2016, uh, Zygogramma defoliated all the parkinium. In the next two years, natural vegetation took over that area. Similarly, Listonotes was introduced in a dry area, Mozo area in central Ethiopia, because this bit, this weevil likes dry area. And it was introduced or released in 2017. Uh, in a parthenium infested area in the in 2018 parthenium got cleared and native vegetation started to take over that area this slide shows cost benefit ratio worked out in australia for implementing biological control of parthenium in australia the cost benefit ratio was two dollars nine cents for each dollar spent for biological control of parthenium in australia now i want to thank Dr. John Bowman, EOR of USAID for the IPM Innovation Lab for supporting this project for the last 10 years and also Dr. Wandy Mercy from Virginia State University for implementing Parthenium Biologic Control Program in Eastern Africa for the past 15 years. And also I want to thank our IPM Innovation Lab staff and faculty for supporting the IPM Innovation Lab program. And above all, I want to thank all the collaborators in these two projects. Thank you very much. So back to you. Thank you, Dr. Mooney. Um, we do have one question for you. First of all, I want to say to Jan that the meaning of life everyone knows is 42. Um, but so, and to Stephen Walsh, I think um, what we'd like to do is, I think that your question is kind of, broader, so I'm, I'm looking to save that for when once we've had all of the presentations and, and give all of the presenters maybe a crack at that because it is a fairly complicated one uh, regarding the measuring the counterfactual, so we will come back to that. Um, in the meanwhile, we do have a question for you, Dr. Mooney, um, from Eugenia Forey, and, and Eugene is asking, can the same parasitoid be used to control the cocoa mealybug? No. It is very specific to papaya mealybug. It won't work on cocoa mealybug. If we know the scientific name of the cocoa mealybug, then we can suggest effective parasites or parasites. Okay, great. Thank you. If no one has any other specific or clarification questions for Dr. Mooney, um, we'd like to go ahead and and have Dr. Prasanna step up. Um, he leads Simit's Global Maze Program. Um, it's focusing primarily on maize improvement in sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and Asia. He provides technical oversight for an array of multi-institutional projects, um, specifically on the development and deployment of improved stress-resilient maize germplasm, um, as well as novel tools and technologies for enhancing genetic gains and breeding efficiency. Um, Dr. Prasanna also leads MAIS, which is a CGIAR alliance, of more than 300 research and development institutions worldwide 
that's seeking to mobilize global resources in maize research and development to achieve a greater strategic impact on maize-based farming systems uh, globally. Um, under his leadership, Simit has established a state-of-the-art maize haploid facility in Kenya, and he and his team have been at the forefront in tackling the maize lethal necrosis epidemic in Eastern Africa, which is where I met him. Um, and uh, they've also been working on the fall armyworm challenge across Africa. Thank you so much, uh, Thor. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, this is a great pleasure to interact with uh, colleagues on this uh, important forum on countering uh, the emerging as well as the future threats, uh, the pest and disease threats uh, to crop plants. I will specifically focus on the maize lethal necrosis management in Africa uh, through intensive multidisciplinary research for development and multi-institutional uh, efforts. A number of institutions are there as Tor initially introduced the topic uh, were involved, right from public sector to private sector institutions, uh, in countering this major threat in Eastern Africa. MLM, for those colleagues who are not so much aware, uh, is a combination, is a co-infection of maize plants with two different viruses. One is the maize chlorotic model virus, another is any member of the Partiviridae, uh, especially the sugarcane mosaic virus has been extensively uh, co-infecting with maize chlorotic model virus in Africa. Uh, since 2011, it was it first appeared in Kenya and then rapidly spread to several countries in uh, Eastern Africa, including Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, uh, DR Congo, and finally Ethiopia in 2014. There were uh, what we call unsubstantiated reports of MLN's presence also uh, in South Sudan and Burundi. Uh, the losses to maize production in the farmer's fields uh, due to this uh, devastating disease could go uh, as high as 80 to 100 percent, uh, depending upon the time of infection and the severity and the environmental factors. Um, economic impact of MLN has been estimated by Simit colleagues uh, in uh, Africa, especially in Kenya and in Ethiopia. In Kenya itself, the disease was mapped to several counties. Uh, the aggregate national loss of maize production due to maize lethal necrosis uh, in 2013 was about uh, half a million tons at a value of almost US dollars, 180 million. So MLN was indeed uh, uh, quite uh, strong in terms of its uh, socio-economic impact uh, uh, in Eastern Africa. How do you tackle such a complex challenge when the virus is... Uh, first time introduced the maize to uh, the chlorotic mortal virus especially and has such a devastating effect, spreads very rapidly primarily due to seed contamination as well as due to insect vectors and maize is grown continuously uh, in many parts of Africa. Uh, we deployed a multidisciplinary and uh, research effort here, not only breeding and deploying MLN resistant varieties working together with partners, uh, international partners, especially USDA, Ohio State University, and University of Minnesota, CALRO, uh, the Kenya Agriculture and Livestock Research Organization, uh, on MLN diagnostics and epidemiology. MLN-free uh, commercial seed production and exchange is a very critical component uh, to um, mitigate this stress within the impacted countries in Eastern Africa as well as to prevent its spread. Uh, to the major maize growing countries in Southern Africa and West Africa. That was done in close collaboration with the national plant protection organizations, seed companies, AGRA, African Agriculture Technology Foundation. Rigorous monitoring and surveillance. Uh, CIMIT trained a lot of NPPO personnel uh, in several countries across Sub-Saharan Africa on uh, digital surveillance coupled with uh, uh, immunostrip based uh, analysis right in the farmer's fields and as well as in the commercial seed production fields. Uh, agronomic management is quite important. Uh, recommendations were passed and Asarika endorsed this. And capacity building, communication and outreach uh, with an area of research and development partners. Uh, the MLN screening facility was established very rapidly thanks to the support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Syngenta Foundation for Sustainable Agriculture, uh, a state-of-the-art facility was established uh, uh, with the generous support of this land from Calro uh, at, at an MLN hotspot uh, in Kenya, uh, that is Naivasha. 
Uh, today, this particular facility offers MLN phenotyping service from CIMIT to an array of partners, both in public and private sector institutions. More than 200,000 germplasm entries have been screened against MLN uh, since its establishment. Of these, 61% come from CIMIT, 17% uh, from the national programs, and 22% from the private sector, a wide array of seed companies again. And thanks to this intensive work from less than four to five inbred lines with resistance to MLN, especially against MCMB, uh, today we are very proud that more than 50 elite and genetically diverse cement lines with MLN resistance are available and disseminated very widely to partners across the world, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, deployment of MLN tolerant and resistant hybrids, again, uh, we have within a span of three to four years released 19 cement derived MLN tolerant resistant hybrids. And uh, out of this, again, bazooka, uh, a drought tolerant and MLN tolerant hybrid released in Uganda, uh, has reached a scale of almost 1500 tons. And today it is marketed extensively not only in Uganda, but also in DR Congo and Burundi. And NASACO has plans to, has recently uh, registered it in Rwanda too. Uh, another major success is partnership with the Kenya Seed Company. And where we have, again, uh, a major hybrid uh, being the H5606, it's uh, substituting a MLN susceptible hybrid uh, in Kenya. So one more hybrid from Seedco uh, is beginning to be commercialized. In 2021, we will see its commercialization across Eastern Africa. And the genetic architecture of MLM resistance in maize has been extensively studied by CIMIT team and a series of uh, publications came out, uh, thankful to Manje Gowda and the team for analyzing the MLM resistance across diverse tropical germplasm, identifying the key genomic regions and validating them within a very short period of time. And that led us uh, to identification of a major QTL for MLN resistance in one of the highly resistant lines, uh, KS23. And this QTL uh, uh, started working across diverse recipient genetic background and is a very powerful tool in our armory uh, to fight against this disease. And once this QTL with a major effect was discovered on chromosome 6, uh, we started in progressing MLN resistance into diverse elite drought tolerant but MLN susceptible uh, CIMIT lines. Uh, and this is a massive effort. 52 such lines have been converted uh, in the last few years and they have been analyzed for their efficacy as well as equivalency. And very soon we'll come up with a series of embed lines that can potentially substitute those old uh, drought tolerant but MLN susceptible lines with the resistant versions. And you can see here the distinct difference between what happens when the resistant QTL is not present uh, versus what happens when the resistant TTL is in progress to fast track uh, marker assisted backcropping. And the genome editing for MLN resistance again uh, has been possible uh, or is becoming possible now. And thanks to the partnership we have now with Corteva, uh, we are very, very grateful to Corteva's partnership here together with Calro, the USDA Agriculture Service. And this project is being funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The chromosome 6 QTL has been fine mapped and today uh, Corteva team together with the CIMIT team uh, is targeting different regions within that 6 KB interval uh, to, uh, to, uh, to identify which edit could be more successful in terms of converting a susceptible line into a resistant line. And we, we plan to establish a strong pipeline to edit for MLN resistance. Uh, in the MLN susceptible lines that are parents of uh, similar derived commercial maize hybrids in Africa. Another major objective of this project is to strengthen the capacity in Africa for genome editing uh, in a crop like maize, which is so important. And strengthening the local capacity, our success did not come only through breeding. Uh, extensive efforts have been made on strengthening local capacity for MLN diagnostics, uh, surveillance using modern tools, and the management uh, overall in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, you can see the, at the bottom of this uh, slide the number of national plant protection organization personnel uh, that have been trained in different countries, not only in the MLN impacted countries, but also in three major maize growing, commercial, 
seed producing countries like uh, Malawi, Zambia and Zimbabwe. Similarly, seed company personnel, national agricultural research and extension staff, seed growers too. So together this is a massive effort in terms of strengthening the capacity of uh, local institutions uh, in countering a transboundary disease like uh, uh, MLN. Uh, so what is the result of all this? Uh, today we have much reduced presence of MLN in Eastern Africa. You can see the red dots there. That means these are still MLN hit spots uh, in Eastern Africa. Uh, but you can still, you can see here these Malawi, Zambia and Zimbabwe are still free from MLN. That to me is a major achievement uh, in terms of this collective effort uh, not permitting MLN to go into uh, Southern Africa or uh, West Africa and saving millions of dollars which could have otherwise uh, socio-economically could have deeply impacted the smallholder farmers. Very thankful to the USAID East Africa office uh, for funding this MLN diagnostics and uh, management project. So MLN is firmly kept under control, but let's remember that it's not eradicated. And we need to keep continuous vigil like what we have done so that uh, we, we maintain this status. Uh, there is a comprehensive MLN information portal. Uh, you can see the website address there. Uh, one can visit that. And uh, a, a, a review paper has been published in Virus Research recently, uh, which uh, outlines all these efforts. Uh, my final thoughts, uh, intensive uh, breeding as well as multidisciplinary and multi-institutional efforts are key uh, for containing the spread and impact of transboundary diseases. And this will not be the first or last instance. Uh, there could be other diseases that could potentially impact uh, continents like Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. We need to have increased capacity for foresight uh, and proactive measures. The systems and platforms should be sustained. Uh, capacity strengthening needs to be continued and the impact expanded in light of this increasing occurrence of devastating transboundary pathogens and pests, especially in the tropics. Many thanks to your site, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, Syngenta Foundation, as well as the CRP names Window 1, Window 2 donors. Calro has been an extremely important partner in our efforts. National Plant Protection Organization, commercial seed sector partners, USDA, Ohio State University, Minnesota University, AATF, Agra, Argo University uh, in Denmark provided tremendous support for our MLN portal as well as IATA uh, which implemented uh, the efforts to uh, prevent the uh, uh, spread of MLN into West Africa. And finally, my civic colleagues for their dedicated work uh, in this whole mission. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you, Dr. Prasanna. Um, as you guys have been seeing in the chat, there have been a lot of questions coming in. Um, we only want to do a couple that are specifically about this particular presentation now, and then the rest of them will bring up at, at the end. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and ask you, um, Dr. Persona, Richard Tinsley has, has asked, you mentioned hybrid lines. Do you also have some composite lines for which the seed can be retained from season to season and avoid the massive logistic of getting hybrid seed to these Yeah, areas. since now we have several genetically diverse inbred lines with uh, some including good combining ability amongst them, it is possible for national programs or interested companies to even synthesize composites uh, using those inbred lines, uh, especially the synthetics we call it, we call them. Like for example, you can take 8 to 10 such diverse inbred lines with good combining ability and uh, synthesized composites. This kind of work is just done by national programs and then uh, disseminated in countries where hybrid feed systems is weak. Uh, but to me, the real uh, challenge here would be how best to, to scale up and deploy the improved varieties that are already available. And uh, for that, we need support from uh, commercial feed sector in a big way. Great, thank you. And we'll do one more for you before we go on to our next presentation. Um, Jean Ristino, two for some reason, <laughs> um, asks, since MLN is primarily transmitted through seed, what efforts are being made by CIMIT to track the spread in African seed systems and prevent future introductions of this or other viral yeah. problems? Second, what strains of the virus have emerged in Africa, and will CIMIT lines be resistant yes. to those? So first question is about... Uh, 
the efforts to prevent the uh, contaminated sweep to flow. That's the reason why we established uh, the MLN quarantine facility at Harare in Zimbabwe. For almost three years, we stopped even sending cement lines uh, seed from uh, Kenya to uh, Southern Africa partners because we need to have a, a multi-layered system of, of quarantine in place together with uh, excellent diagnostic tools. Even then, we do need to have quarantine facilities established, not just for MLN, for any disease, any transboundary disease. And therefore, CIMIT established this in partnership with Zimbabwe. Again, thanks to your site support. And today, we, we see at multiple levels any seed that goes from Kenya, an, M an MLN impacted country in Kenya, first of all, we need to make sure that the seed is not contaminated in the seed production field. Second, we need to have an internal system of diagnostics to check whether the seed lot is free from the virus. Third, it goes to the uh, regulatory agency like CAFIS to ensure that the seed lot is indeed virus free. Fourth, you can't take any chances. You still need to introduce the seed in a quarantine facility like what we have established in Zimbabwe uh, so that that's a final check. Only when you ensure all these systems are in place and then the seed is multiplied and disseminated to partners. Similarly, the project on BNGF funded MLN epidemiology project, we established uh, an MLN quarantine facility in Nigeria so that the West Africa also introduces the germplasm. Germplasm flow should not be curtailed, but we need to be cautious in terms of ascertaining that every seed lot, whether it is a research lot or a commercial seed lot, uh, is free from MLN virus. All right, great. Thank you. And we'll bring up the rest of the questions um, that you guys have uh, at the end in the, in the final question and answer period. Um, for now, I'd like to go ahead and introduce you to Dr. Priswa. Um, he currently serves as the Dean for the Faculty of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences at Kiskeya University. Um, he founded the uh, Haitian Center for Innovation in Biotechnology and Sustainable Agriculture in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, back in 2010, um, with sorghum and edible, I apologize for this, Jatropha breeding programs. Um, he is a Haitian national who's trained as a sorghum breeder and a plant, applied plant geneticist with the French Research Institute for Development, Simit, and Cornell Universities. Um, he has steadily expanded Haiti's crop improvement research portfolio in his, into his current team of more than 40 staff members led by seven new research faculty members at the Kiskeya University. Welcome, Dr. Priswa. So I'm going to tell the story about saving sorghum from disappearance in Haiti. It's a uh, work uh, that has been going on now for about seven years uh, and has been supported by a great number of donors and partners. It's always hard in breeding, so it's very important partners. It all started with Shiraz and followed by uh, IABB and Laval University, more recently the Sorghum Millet Innovation Lab, and we're now part of the Innovation Lab of Improvement, which is really the science. We're saving sorghum from disappearance in Haiti. So, Melanophis saccharai, the uh, sorghum biotype uh, of shuriking aphid, appeared in Haiti in 2015 after uh, the breaking out in the United States in 2013, and the spread has been very fast. From 2015, a lot of regions uh, in around Port-au-Prince in the Central Plateau were affected, and by 2016, all sorghum growing areas here indicated as percentage of agricultural land across Haiti were affected, and yields plummeted, as we'll see in a slide after. So here's the little beast, and you can see uh, that uh, it's a, it's an asexual aphid, and even the wing type is uh, is affected uh, by uh, is is also asexual, and it spreads very rapidly. So we're going to talk about now our success story, University of Kiskeya, our unique success story of uh, solving the aphid uh, resistance. And it all started actually way before the aphid strife stroke. It started in 2010 uh, with the initiation of our breeding program. Uh, it was supported by the French National Research Agency, 
Uh, and it's key to what happened after. What we did is that we evaluated a very large uh, set of diverse uh, lines from all over the world. Uh, and then we set up a rapid cycling uh, project in which we were doing one generation of recurrent selection every year. And what you can see is in this slide is that it's an S1 recurrent selection scheme in which we're doing three generation a year or close to every year. Uh, and then catching up. But the fact is that we generated a large number of crosses and generation actually before the aphid stroke, even if it was a short uh, breeding uh, program. So here is what happened, and that's work supported by the Sorghum Millet Innovation Lab. This is what we pictured after uh, going through selection, and then we'll see the results of the selection is that our current population is very highly related to the East African Caldatums, uh, because we were actually using a lot of spay green from Ethiopia uh, as a source, and um, but not only, but we have here in the population structure in the D, we can see that we have some kafirs, we have some duras, and mostly some Afri uh, Caldatums with East Africa being the largest contributors, and some guineas and wild types into the mix. So it's a pretty uh, diverse population, almost as diverse as the Acreza gene pool, a little less than Texas a and but a pretty diverse uh, population. We did map uh, the aphid uh, resistance, um, and we mapped it not through classical mapping, but detection, the selection, the signature of selection. That's also work that we did with parts part of SMIL. Uh, a paper is being prepared by Kibede Muleta from Jock Morris Lab in collaboration with us. And it's in short harm of chromosome 6, which was confirming a previous paper uh, from China uh, mapping the arm ES1 locus. And it helped us to refine an area of five to six genes, uh, which comprise about three NBS LR genes. Uh, and so that's the fine mapping that we did. What's interesting is that the Haitian um, material you can see in the figure uh, in your lower right, uh, there's a predominance of a very rare apotype now after the selection in sorghum. So there was a total selected sweep. It's a very rare allele uh, that's a little present in the United States in a few aphid resistance lines and is only a uh, frequent allele of, uh, in Ethiopia, and especially in the zero zero uh, material. We were able to independently confirm uh, the gene, developing a diagnostic markers. And in the lower uh, left, you can see the confirmation of the allele genotypes related to aphid damage rating and an American uh, population that was developed independently from our material using our diagnostic markers. So it was great. So now let's go back to the impact on farmers. So now sorghum, titimia, as we call it in Haiti, is back in our fields and in our plates. And these are two extreme regions in the upper south and uh, the northwest of Haiti uh, where sorghum was back. And that was after a significant and uh, dramatic um, fall of the year. So in 2015, so that's the red arrow, uh, you can see uh, that's when the aphid appeared. And from the first year the aphid was uh, identified, uh, production plummeted, especially in the second autumn season. And then the following year in 2016 and 2017, population Production of sorghum went from over 100,000 ton to under 20,000 ton with, uh, uh, with 14,000 ton in 2017. Late 2017 is when we really uh, introduced Papa Pichon, our first developed line, and that is work that I'll show uh, with, that we did with support of Canada Global Affairs uh, in partnership with Laval University uh, after the beginning of our green program with sorghum. And now 90% of the production sorghum acreage is now grown uh, with shibas resistant varieties. Some farmers do not like the non-photopiotic type, and we'll see that we're now developing the photopiotic type, and that's because of the way they do the relay cropping uh, with the photopiotic variety. So uh, production recovered. Uh, this was the official release with the 
Minister of Agriculture, the President of the Republic, and the Canadian Ambassador of Canada have supported uh, the development of the resistant lines uh, and the, um, the release of the Papetichon uh, varieties. So now the challenge is not completely over because there, were, there are different demands from our growers who initially developed a dual purpose sweet sorghum. Uh, one of the varieties that was later selected for yield stability and the upper uh, left is Bateau Moïse after Pape uh, that was selected through the Sorry Millet Innovation Lab. Uh, we're now developing with the support from a local brewery, a mechanization ready uh, tall dwarf. So this is a dwarf in the lower um, end, uh, but there were out for the dwarf, but this is one of our dwarfs. Uh, and here, and, uh, and it's just very striking, you can see uh, that uh, this are the photoperiodic sorghum, and this is picture from this year. We're now selecting an aphid resistance, and this is our selection plot. So you can see how it looked in the beginning when we started selection. This is the damage that the aphid causes, and it's pretty dramatic, and you can see the resistance and uh, are very striking. And although it's a major gene, we now know that there are uh, other factors affecting resistance, and you can see in the protopiotic type that not everyone is as resistant. And this is work supported by actually a project from the Ministry of Agriculture with the Inter-American Development Bank support uh, and the selection of photoperiodic FDA resistant sorghum and it's going very well there also. It takes a team too to succeed. Uh, here is a picture of a couple of my members and the list. Uh, given time, I won't list everyone. So I would like to thank everyone on my team, but also people from the Morris Lab, Kansas State, with whom we collaborated in the Sorghum Millet Innovation Lab, from the Butler Lab that provided a lot of support on developing cheap genotyping and our DHL lab, uh, University of Laval, Canada, that after CIRAD allowed us to develop a lot of the material, and CIRAD in France that got it, that helped us with the security funding to get it all started after the earthquake. So now we're working on other emerging pests and disease, uh, hoping to replicate our sorghum success. As I mentioned, the development of the FCA resistance and protopiotic sorghum, and that's a big farmer demand. And we're going to be working uh, with support from the Ministry of Agriculture, but also with the Innovation Lab for Crop Improvement for the genotyping. Uh, we hope to be able to work on Richard's Bloom uh, and Pigeon Pea. Uh, we're starting work there. Uh, Tau has almost disappeared from Haiti because of the introduction of new, a new uh, Phytophthora colacaciae. Uh, on taro and uh, starting also some defensive breeding in cassava African mosaic viruses and as you can see there are a number of emerging threats that are uh, a threat to Haiti. I thank to all of our donors because breeding takes time and it's hard to find donors to breed to fund only a part of the breeding. So French National Agency we mentioned then, Canada Global Affairs, the Feed the Future program first to SMIL and now to ILKI and the Inter American Development Bank and the Minister, Haitian Ministry of Agriculture. Thanks to them, and thank you all for your uh, attention. Thank you, Dr. Persoua. Um, we have just a couple of quick questions for you before we go into the final presentation. Um, first of all, Patrice Thomas asks, how do you commercialize the improved varieties since you're a university? What is your market channel to allow the, this improved variety to reach farmers? Uh, so now that's kind of a big challenge because we don't yet have a seed arm, although we are allied with an organization in the South that does seed production and we do minimal seed production ourselves. Uh, so we had a project for the large mass production of seeds and use it for the first uh, release. Uh, now we're trying to develop a model integrated with mechanization uh, to develop new models of service providers that would serve as, as intermediaries. As we do have two producers, but there is definitely a gap in Haiti uh, for uh, basically seed selling and the network of uh, getting the seed growers. So we're trying to develop kind of a, a middleman service provider approach, small scale mechanization. That's another program which we're actually hiring right now, uh, postdocs and everything, small mechanization. Uh, so thank you for your question, but it's something that's not entirely solved, but we are working on it 
uh, trying to develop models for our seed diffusion, not only in sorghum, but in other crops. Great, thank you. And we have kind of a related question. Um, Stephen Walsh asks, can you comment on the pest impacts of sorghum diversity in Haiti? So on sorghum diversity, yes. I mean, almost uh, production plummeted to under 20,000 tons, so all the former land races, a lot of them might have disappeared. So we're actually trying to rescue them, and, ask, and it's, it's kind of a... Uh, Simultaneous goal of our photoperiodic program, uh, bringing SCA resistance into photoperiodic sorghum. It's at the same time saving the land races and also addressing a specific demand from our growers, especially in the most, in the most marginal areas of Haiti, which are requesting, hey, I do, I do relay cropping and you know what? Your photoperiodic variety doesn't, uh, do it for me. And, uh, they're developing strategy but having huge yield loss of their photoperiodic variety. So we're making, we're, we're duplicating the program that we had, making a lot of crosses between all the photoperiodic material that we can recover. Uh, we had shared some with our CIRAD partners and they saved some uh, two type land races. So we are also working and trying to rescue the land races, bringing the sorghum shooting aphid resistance into these lands. All right, great, thank you. I think that one of the things that we've seen um, from our previous three speakers is how complex it is for us to be working on these issues um, and the, the level of collaboration that we need um, in order to bring these research-based solutions to some of the ag development programming that we have. Um, so next up, we have a, a couple of our, our team from USAID who are going to talk a little bit about um, a new design uh, uh, activity that is coming through. We have um, Dr. Bertram, who is our Chief Scientist in USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. He is serving as the key advisor on a range of technical and program issues in order to advance global food security and nutrition. Um, he is leading USAID's evidence-based efforts to advance research, technology, and implementation in support of the U.S. government's global hunger and food security initiatives. Um, and oh. And presenting with him, sorry, <laughs> uh, presenting with him is Dr. Record. Uh, she is the science advisor at USAID in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, where she manages U.S. university-led plant disease, crop improvement, and post-harvest handling research programs. Um, she ha has she was selected as the scholar fellow for a science communications pro program and a science policy fellow with the American Phytopathological Society. She currently serves as the deputy lead of the Resilience and Food Security Research Community of Practice. Thank you very much, Tor. I'm going to start off, everyone. Well, I think the best way to follow those three tremendous presentations was to share with you our intention to stand up a new Feed the Future Innovation Lab for current and emerging threats to crops. Innovation and um, I think uh, right now in the context we're in of COVID, locust plagues, uh, I think the whole world is attuned to the issue of, uh, of emerging threats, greater awareness perhaps than ever before. Um, we're, the new lab will be focusing on crops, as I mentioned, we're focusing on, we won't be covering all emerging threats, but we do also have a new animal health lab working on a major disease of cattle in Africa. We have the Poultry Innovation Lab working on Newcastle's disease and heat tolerance in genomics. So we have other uh, programs addressing the emerging threats in animals, and, and we'll continue to monitor and think about the best ways to engage there as well. So uh, thinking about the uh, challenge of current and emerging threats, as you can see, and we've just heard, there are a variety of threats. They're difficult to control, especially in environmentally safe and sound ways. And we've also, I think, seen highlighted this morning the role of research in generating solutions. And I have to say, having just heard these presentations, it's so impressive the speed with which the community and these researchers have come together with partners to, to generate solutions. 
We also know that in food insecure regions where USAID works on food security through Feed the Future uh, and Resilience, we see uh, a greater vulnerability in part because agriculture is such an important part of the economy. So many people's incomes and livelihoods and food security depend on it directly. I think we've also noted this morning the importance of global research networks that are linked together to produce to producer communities and and really you could see the tremendous potential of south south cooperation all of our speakers i think identified some opportunities there but also the importance of this of this uh, connection but amongst researchers uh, to be able to respond rapidly as uh, uh, to existing or emerging threats. The other point I would like to make is this is an area where uh, public investment is critical. Um, for example, the type we do through the Feed the Future uh, Innovation Labs, uh, this is um, the opportunities for private investment in many of these to deal with many of these threats would be very limited. So this is another reason that the um, the uh, it's it's so relevant and compelling to stand up a new research program in this area. Now, I just wanted to take advantage of a recent paper by Savory et al., uh, just from last year, that this just looked at four crops, primarily those that are also important in temperate regions, but you can see the tremendous value of lot crop losses from pests and diseases, uh, especially in rice, uh, where it's, what, $4 billion. What this slide doesn't show, and which the paper didn't deal with, uh, were, was the impact of, on crops like cassava or sorghum, the things we've heard talked about this morning, mango or papaya, excuse me. Um, so uh, there are many important tropical crops that are critical to food security in the regions where, where Feed the Future works are not included, but we know that the losses can be tremendous, and several of our speakers all of our speakers really alluded to uh, the um, magnitude of those losses and, and the disruption that these uh, uh, pests caused. Now, Feed the Future, uh, may, many of you know that this is the 10th year of Feed the Future. And uh, in, our, in just 10 years, we thought about what, what threats have emerged that we've had to deal with. Fall armyworm, a tremendous problem in Africa and Asia now uh, with the um, emergence of an exotic pest from the Americas. That's, and it's spread across th those continents in just four or five years. We had, we've heard all about maize lethal necrosis, uh, wheat blast. I know we have people on the, 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 um, in the seminar this morning from Bangladesh. Uh, this was uh, noticed for the first time in Asia. I believe I just read that it's also appeared in Africa now. Uh, this is a disease of wheat that had formerly been uh, uh, found only in the Americas, and now we have it in other parts of the world. And, uh, and, and then Fusarium wilt, tropical race four, began in Mozambique, is now in South America and Colombia and in banana growing areas, and it's a, a devastating uh, disease that uh, not only affects Cavendish, but many, many varieties of bananas that, and plantains that are critical to food security. So in all of these cases, we've responded one way or another, um, uh, often through South-South partnerships, often through working with the interagency, with our partners in, in uh, USDA, uh, to, to rapidly tap into the expertise that exists both in USDA and in American universities. So it's, uh, again, just uh, to point out again the, uh, the, the speed with which the research community has stepped up. And we're, we're excited in the new lab to think about continuing these efforts. Finally, um, Tor mentioned at the outset of our session today the role of the Global Food Security Act, which um, uh, made really what was Feed the Future, the law of the land, first under President Obama and then reauthorized under President Trump. Um, there are three act aspects of that, that I have the, the research strategy developed under the Global Food Security Act that are particularly important to, to point out. One is advancing productivity frontier. The second, though, is reducing risk, which is a, a huge aspect of the focus here. And the third is the human outcomes in nutrition, economic opportunity, and gender equity. 
And, you know, we, we've seen this morning, for example, on nutrition, food safety uh, issues that are associated with um, poorly controlled, whether it's aflatoxin contamination or the use of pesticides that in, in an uh, uh, unenlightened way. Uh, there, all three of the objectives of the research strategy um, are critical. Or also just the fact that you, we're limiting uh, uh, the availability of an important food like papaya affects the vitamin A status of people who depend on papaya as an important source of vitamin A in their diet. And finally, uh, just to note that we will be working with our sister agencies uh, in Feed the Future and the interagency working group. Uh, one of the, the, the explicit uh, aspects of the law is that we seek to develop our investments and in research under the Global Food Security Act in ways that leverage and draw on and learn from the important experience of other agencies like USDA, uh, the uh, NSF, NIH, etc. Many, many important partners in that in that space. So now I'd like to stop and turn it to my colleague uh, Angela Records, and she'll say more about the design of the lab. Thank you, Rob. Uh, yeah, so I'm just going to drill down a little bit on our intention to. Uh, fund in a, a research activity in this space. Um, so as we heard from the previous presenters, the scientific and development communities have learned a lot about crop pests and pathogens over the years and made great strides uh, toward mitigating those that plague agriculture in the countries where we work and, and um, around the world, really. It's a global problem. Um, but important questions remain, and pests and pathogens will continue to evolve and expand their geography. Um, so we propose to use research as one of our key approaches to addressing current and emerging threats to crops. Importantly, this approach responds to the global food security research strategy, which Rob just described. It gives us an opportunity to build on lessons that we have learned through our own programming, like the IPM Innovation Lab, as well as other efforts. And our approach opens the door to a consultative design process that incorporates those learnings and considers the current pace of emerging threats and the challenges of existing issues. So generally, our research investments abide by core operating principles. GFS research is purpose-driven. It generates and sustains global public good and leverages data to accelerate research impact. GFS research activities are continuously monitoring and evaluating progress, thereby learning and adapting as appropriate. Global food security research promotes empowerment and equi equitable participation in science and strengthens agricultural innovation systems. Importantly, GFS research efforts are oriented towards supporting scaling, helping us ensure that technologies reach end users. We can't take on these efforts without extensive partnerships. A number of partners come together to implement, implement the global food security research strategy. This slide just takes a closer look at our innovation partners, uh, the Feed the Future Innovation Labs, which I'll talk about in just a moment, and our activities um, at the CGIAR, International Agricultural Research Centers, make up the bulk of our research portfolio. We also have various investments that fall into the other category, including uh, support for discrete research activities through public-private partnerships, investments in capacity development and training programs, engagements and efforts to ensure that efficient systems are in place to get clean, improved seed to farmers, and other um, types of activities. And then um, the USAID mission in our partner countries have their own budgets and goals, and they, and they also support research. Uh, so the Feed the Future Innovation Labs are U.S. university-led research programs that collectively address a range of research themes sustainable intensification, animal health, crop improvement, for example. Um, and the innovation labs themselves have an array of partners. And uh, many of our innovation labs hold sub-award competitions to identify additional partners to focus on particular research questions or work streams. And we currently, there are 21 Feed the Future innovation labs. And as Rob pointed out earlier, Feed the Future is a whole-of-government initiative. This slide just shows the collective of agencies that participate in our Feed the Future interagency working group on research. And uh, our timeline and process for putting together a new innovation lab on current and emerging threats to crops 
begins with consultations, including webinars like this one, focus groups, and other discussions. We're developing a white paper that will lay out some of the context and thinking behind the proposed innovation lab. We hope to complete that by late November, at which time we plan to um, hope to release a solicitation toward a proposed award date of June uh, 2021. Uh, and a design team here at USAID is working on these various elements. You know, you all know Rob Bertram, our chief scientist. Julie March is leading the team. She's an ecologist and the chief of our production systems division in the Center for Agri Growth. I'm a plant pathologist. Um, Carol Levin leads on knowledge management and coordination of our innovation lab portfolio. She is an entomologist. Mark Gilkey is an entomologist who's working with us on detail from the USDA Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. And then Siobhan Whiten is a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow. She's also an entomologist. And she's taken on a number of important tasks related to this design, including um, as the lead writer for the white paper with input from Mark. So that is all I have, Tor. I, we can check with Rob to see if he has anything to add, but otherwise I will pass the microphone back to you. No, I think, we, I think it'd be great to turn to the discussion. Thank you. Super. So we have about 20 minutes, it looks like. Uh, we do have a lot of questions that have come up. Um, some of them can hopefully go fairly quickly, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the specific ones. Um, Dr. Mooney, I have a couple that were very specific for you. Um, and, and then uh, hopefully toward the end we'll be able to have ones that are opened up to all of you, um, specific also to, to Rob and uh, Angela to talk about how um, the new activity may address them. Um, Dr. Mooney... Uh, we had the question from Patrice Thomas, when your project gets a hold of these different threats, how do you connect to the experts in order to get solutions? They can send me an email. I can respond to them. There are also several scientists who work in different uh, research topic areas, so they can directly communicate with them to get that information. Did I answer that? I, I hope so. I would say as well, um, maybe uh, with these new designs that are coming out, there might be some opportunities to um, identify emergent threats from the field um, so, that, so that they can kind of swing into action on that. But we'll see how that, how that all comes out. Um, another question for you, Dr. Mooney. Uh, classical biocontrol is and should be regulated by national authorities but regulatory systems are often weak and can end up hindering the use of biocontrol. What can be done to address this? You know, the FAO has a code of conduct for, for introducing any natural enemies from outside the country. So they can follow that code of conduct of the FAO in involving bi classical biological control. Of course, the nation, national quarantine Officials should be aware of that, but in the case of Ethiopia, where we have been working on bi biological control of parthenium, we have been uh, involving the national regulatory officials as well as following the USAID and USDA regulations. In India, of course, they have very good uh, regulatory system in place, so we, we have been following that system. So each country has to develop its own if it doesn't have it or they can communicate with the international organizations like FAO to get the code of conduct. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I, have, I have two questions for you that kind of, um, I, I think, speak to the same issue. So let me, um, one is, what is the risk that biological controls attack useful crops once they've controlled the pests that they were intended to control? And then the other is, Will the biocontrol agents survive once the target organisms disappear? How long do they remain active in the field? You know, the biological control organisms are selected based on their host specificity. They are very specific to the host, so they won't attack others. If they do attack the other ones, they won't get the permission to be released in those countries. So, and also if the host population goes down, the parasite or the predatory population also will go down. So the host won't reach a zero level population 
So if it was, say, about the 80% level, it will come down to 10 or 20% level. So both the pest and the parasite or the natural enemy will operate at a very low level, below the economic threshold level. That is what will happen in the country. All right. Thank you, Dr. Mooney. Um, Dr. Prasanna, I have a couple of questions that are specifically for you. Yes. Um, I just heard echo, but that's all right. Um, okay. So the first one is, if MLN is caused by viral infection, is there any possibility for human or livestock infection? No. There is no possibility. These are very specific to, for example, maize chlorotic mortis virus is specific to maize. And the sugarcane mosaic virus has different hosts, but these are these do not affect human or livestock. Okay, thank you. Um, what is the tolerance or resistance level of the lines that, that you've been developing? Um, and is reinfection feasible in the field? Uh, we have a very robust system, not only testing our germplasm under uh, artificial inoculation, uh, and rigorous assessment in the, at the Naivasha facility, but we also have a satellite of of uh, centers uh, where we can do uh, analysis of the same hybrids, validate the responses from the natural conditions in MLN impacted countries. So these ensure that even if there is a, a slight variation, for instance, especially in sugarcane mosaic virus, the the responses of the host level uh, still holds good. MCMV has very limited variation, uh, as, as we understand in Africa, but a sugarcane mosaic virus could have certain diversity in terms of strains. So even otherwise, even there are new party viruses that can cause infection. Uh, our system of testing ensures that these varieties hold good and they are indeed holding good. So therefore, there is no cause for concern uh, that there could be a breakdown of this resistance because this resistance is mostly polygenic resistance and therefore it would survive. Okay, great. Thank you. And I believe actually that answers um, also what the other question was for you. Um, so, Dr. Persua, I have just a couple for you specifically, and then I'm going to ask the more general ones um, for everyone to address. Um, let's see. Can you comment on the pest imp Oh, no, sorry. That one already was answered. Uh, why did you select sorghum rather than maize? Is sorghum a staple food in Haiti? Thank you, uh, Thor. Uh, so, yes, sorghum is one of the three main cereals grown in Haiti. Same with the slaves uh, uh, to Haiti uh, during uh, colonial time. And so we, we basically produced, uh, before the aphid, 100,000 tons of sorghum, 100,000 tons of rice, and about 250,000 tons of maize, corn. So maize is the main cereal. And also, often maize and sorghum are kind of associated. Maize is more of a spring crop, although it can be uh, grown in the second season, but sorghum is basically the second season crop and often grown in relay cropping with corn and uh, um, uh, pulses, uh, including pigeon pea and association. So sorghum is a major crop. Now we we did introduce and test, uh, we, we, we worked with CIMIT uh, a few years ago, and we're now still promoting a synthetic from maize that was produced and developed by CIMIT and tested by CIMIT in Haiti with uh, a number of partners, including ourselves. So there is a synthetic uh, of CIMIT that we're promoting. Uh, we, are all, we also have a rice breeding program, so we work in all three cereals and a number of uh, not not myself, but people from my team. Okay, great. Thank you. And so would you expect that the improved varieties that you're developing will perform well in other countries of relatively similar agroclimatic conditions? That's a very good question. And actually with the Innovation Lab for Crop Improvement, we're working on yield stability as one of our main focus. And we're working with some Latin American country and especially INTA from Costa Rica. Uh, and we're going to be testing these uh, varieties, these SCA resistant varieties in Central America, especially in Costa Rica soon. Uh, my guess is that these varieties are being produced with uh, help from uh, the French National Research Agency, Canada Global Affairs, and USAID. So you are free to request 
expertise from these varieties uh, respecting local quarantine laws, but we are happy to share to have these uh, seeds and varieties in other places, especially as one of our main focuses on uh, yield stability. We're especially happy if anyone is able to test the whole population <laughs> anywhere in the world. Please be our guest. That's great. Well, Thank you. I hope everybody took note of that. <laughs> um, so you can be requesting germplasm from, from them. Um, so I, I'd like to now um, ask some of the more general questions. And um, presenters, I, I, I suppose we'll, we'll leave it to you to, to jump in on it. Let's try to be uh, as brief as we can because we have several of these larger questions um, and we only have about 10 minutes. Uh, the first one is that um, I suppose that with population growth, greater intensification of production systems, and globalization of markets and trade, there is a natural vulnerability to wider spread of pests and diseases. To what extent is there potential to strengthen regulatory systems to reduce spread between countries and regions? Uh, Tor, shall I take a stab at that, if, unless somebody else wants to come in? Um, I, I think it really depends. But the point is very well taken in as much as we have a globalized world now, and we've seen uh, uh, it's a smaller world in many respects, so we've seen uh, particularly uh, uh, exotic pests and diseases introduced one, from one region to another. We also, though, heard an example today of, of, of just a, a new uh, uh, threat evolving through a complex of, of two different viruses. I think uh, the... Uh, the issues around sanitary and phytosanitary uh, is clearly an important aspect of uh, trying to control uh, pests. In some cases, for in the case in the uh, Fusarium race four in banana, uh, it's it's really almost like an embargo. You have to almost quarantine an area uh, because it's 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 you need so much not to have material transported from one region to another. So I don't think it's a one-size-fits-all, uh, but we certainly work closely with uh, the authorities that are involved in, uh, and our missions do as well, uh, in uh, sanitary and phytosanitary and uh, trade issues related to that. Uh, so I think it's it's one more arrow in the quiver I think probably the lab itself is really about research for problems which lack solutions, but I think we also have to keep other solutions in view. You know, it's not a silver bullet approach. Thank you. Torin, yeah, Prasanna here. Uh, uh, yeah, just to quickly add to Rob's comment, uh, there is a tremendous uh, need for strengthening the capacity, the diagnostic capacity, as well as the quarantine capacity of the national partners. That's what we we have learned in the last 10 years uh, through both MLN as well as the Fala Miwam. Uh, it's not only the regulatory agencies in the lab level, but also at the border level, uh, in, interceptions of contaminated uh, commodities. So I think, uh, in general, there are a number of countries uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa which need that support. Uh, it, it, we have done very little so far, and there is a lot that needs to be done in terms of strengthening the local capacity of institutions uh, in undertaking diagnostics for the presently emerging as well as the future possible threats. We need to have a compendium of such uh, devastating transboundary pathogens. And there is no uh, what we call uh, a prediction capacity right now or analytical capacity in many countries. So we need to strengthen that under the new innovation lab. So this is Muni. And Agreed. Thank you, Dr. Prasada. Go ahead, Dr. Muni. In the IPM Innovation Lab, we work on specific areas of the specific subject areas with the respective countries. Like, for example, in the quarantine aspects of the Parthenium biological control, we work with Ethiopia, Kenya, and uh, Uganda uh, quarantine patient regulatory officials. And in Nepal, we work with the PQPMC for introducing some of the regulatory activities. We also work in developing the human and capacity building in the regulatory areas in the respective countries where we work. 
that's a good thing to add to to notice notice of the, of the new the new innovation lab is coming on, but we do already have a lot of these structures in place that we are currently working on them. Thank you, Dr. Mooney. Um, I have a really quick question that I'm going to read, but I have um, I have a written answer to it, and then I'm going to go ahead and, and turn things over to Rob and Angela to talk about. There are several different questions that are specific about the new design, um, so I'm going to turn it over to them. The, the question really quickly is measuring the counterfactual crops and money saved via mitigation or control of pests and pathogen is a really big challenge. Do we have any standard protocols or lessons for making these estimates? Um, and we do have a response that Dr. George Norton, who is a professor of economics at Virginia Tech, um, he does impact assessments of IPM technologies implemented in different countries. You may want to contact him for the standards established for such assessments. Um, so with that, uh, Rob and Angela, I, I guess if you want to open up your mics, um, I, can, I can go ahead and let me read some of the questions that folks are asking about the new activity, um, and then you can uh, arrange how you want, what order you want to answer them in. Um, are there specific countries or regions that the new lab should focus on? How will the ag research agenda work with public and private extension sector partners? Um, Will the Innovation Lab consider a similar lab for current and emerging threats to livestock? Will biotechnology be supported as an approach to develop durable strategies? Um, and then there, there's just a whole bunch of uh, current thinking about the new design, which crops, geographic focus, partners, focus on prediction or response, et cetera. Sure, this is Angela. I'm happy to jump in on some of these and then pass it over to Rob. Um, so there, there are some rules about how much we can um, discuss in advance of the solicitation, but I can say that our intention for this innovation lab to design is to be minimally prescriptive in terms of, you know, what the best um, research questions and, and technologies are, um, you know, which crops, which geographic focus. There will be, you know, some parameters. But again, we, we really want to see, um, you know, what our partners in uh, the scientific and development communities, um, you know, offer as suggestions. Uh, and um, so, you know, that would be kind of the, the, the basic answer to that question, is that we don't in anticipate being overly prescriptive um, in, our, in our solicitation. Uh, and... Uh, I'll pass it to Rob to answer the question about livestock and, and a couple of other these. Rob? Thanks, Angela. Uh, well, first on livestock, uh, we very much take the point that current and emerging threats are not limited uh, to crops. And, of course, as I mentioned earlier, we, will, we are addressing livestock threats. But I can tell you that um, there's a lot of interest in this right now. Uh, and it goes beyond just uh, the threats to the livestock sector, but also the whole issue of One Health. As we're suffering from a global pandemic, uh, the, the issue of zoonotic diseases is huge. So, uh, I, 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 James, I think we need to, we will stay engaged on this and, and uh, keep everyone informed as our thinking advances. And I think it would be a great subject for another AgriLinks uh, uh, seminar. Um, I think there's a question on biotechnology too. Our approach on this, uh, Diana, is that we uh, we take a, a science-based, evidence-based approach on any of the solutions that would be developed. Uh, also, the scalability, uh, the potential to address, uh, and we know that a range of scientific tools could be leveraged by our partners in the innovate, new innovation lab. So I, I believe that's really going to be, uh, uh, it will be open to all solutions. Uh, and I think, um, a rain, uh, it, as Angela just said, we're going to be looking for ideas and uh, on new in, and innovative research approaches to so solving major problems uh, from our partners. So I think, we can't say definitively right now what will be there, but uh, we are open. Thank you. 
All right, everybody. I think I think we're getting right up to, to six o'clock. So um, I would like to thank all of you for your engagement today and for um, joining us on this. I look forward to to seeing more as we learn about the new innovation lab that's coming out. Thank you and have a great night.